Hello, and thank you for listening to this episode of the Indigenous Environmental Justice Project podcast. In preparation for September 30th, which is both the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation and Orange Shirt Day, our principal investigator Deborah McGregor spoke with Angela Look, Brock Pinawanagua, and Ruth Green about what this day means to them, how they plan to spend it, and what their expectations are for settler allies. There are some heavy topics addressed in this discussion, including drug use, overdose, suicide, and violence. So listener discretion is advised. If you feel like you need to talk to someone after listening, there are many organizations you can reach out to, including the Indian Residential School Survivors and Family 24-Hour Crisis Line, Hope for Wellness Helpline, and for those in Ontario, CAMH Aboriginal Service. You can find a list of these resources and how to contact them on our website at iejproject.info.urq.ca. Thanks for your consideration, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Ani bonjour, so thank you for joining me. Um, this is a conversation about uh, the National Day of Reconciliation or Orange Shirt Day and how you know a few scholars, but also people, people who live and, and work in our communities and are part of also the York community, um, reflect upon this day um, and how it influences some of our, our research or teaching or scholarship or just being in this place. And I'm just starting. So Deborah McGregor, uh, White Fish River First Nation in Ishtabe, but also York University uh, professor at uh, Osgoode Hall Law School and the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. And as I as I think about this day, um, I think about how I, I guess what comes to mind is kind of decolonization, even though that could mean just about anything, like I find it means just about anything to anyone, everyone would have their own idea about what that is. But to me, it means they're not being more asked of Indigenous people, that we're not being asked to do Indigenous things and perform indigeneity for, for people to try to figure out what this means. That to me, it means other people, like other people, non-Indigenous people and others who are who are trying to learn, to really make it a point to learn from a lot of resources that already exist, to realize it's not just one day in the year to be thinking about this, like it's our everyday lived reality in our families and our communities, and, and to think about what they need to do to learn more about this day and the residential schools and the people that survived them and the people who didn't. That was front page news in May and June, um, and how to, how to process that and think about what just relations looks like for uh, for Indigenous peoples. So my mother went to residential school. She went to uh, Spanish, which has since been burnt down. They're just starting the work of seeing if they can locate um, burial sites, which they know are there. That's part of the oral history of the people who went to that residential school. And um, so how it influences me, fortunately, she retained her language. But it wasn't, um, but she didn't teach it to us because you actually, I guess, have to want to teach it to people, <laughs> even though I would have heard it my whole life. And she almost lost it, she said. But my dad was always in a fluent environment, like growing up, his family, she was from Wakamakong and she married into White Fish River. That's all they spoke all the time. So she was able to maintain uh, maintain the language and eventually become an educator and, and actually taught language. So to me, that's probably, other than a lot of her experiences of, um, of violence in the, in the residential school and what she saw, and, and in some ways inspired by her because she tried to overcome it as an educator herself. So she's very compassionate. She understood what kids were going through and they were having a hard time in the school. So she, took, she was very compassionate in her approach to, to education. 
I also saw it as a way out of that situation. Like she really uh, encouraged us to, to do well in school. She saw it as a way kind of out of the situation, you know, that she was living with, uh, living with every day in terms of poverty and racism and everything else. So in many ways, she's also inspiring. So a lot of, so in my view, there's, there's also a lot of really inspiring stories. When I'm having a bad day, I kind of think, actually, I think any one of her days, the whole time she was there was probably a hundred times worse than any day, than any day I'm having, right? So, so I think about that as well. So in terms of my research, probably the biggest loss or challenge that, that I have in the work that I do in Indigenous knowledge systems um, and legal systems is not knowing the language. Like, I feel like I've hit the wall. I've learned everything I can possibly learn in English. Um, I'm not going to learn anything more from reading more stuff. I'm not going to learn anything more from asking people the same questions they've already answered for me however many times. That the only way to kind of go deeper into, into this work to try to help deal with a lot of the big challenges all of humanity faces, like you know, climate, climate change, climate justice, is if I start to start to learn that. So I see part of this day is really thinking about that and trying to reclaim that and seeing how you know, acquiring language, some facility in it, in, in working with uh, my mother and others to try to, to, I see that right now is really one of the only ways to kind of advance what I'm doing, because I sort of feel like I've hit the wall. <laughs> and I need, in order to, to push it further means I need to learn more. And fortunately for me, uh, in the community, they do offer community language classes that's taught by my mother and sister who went to the, the same I don't know if you'd call it immersion program block Brock, but so now she's teaching in an immersion school in Chiging. And so they teach this course. I really like it because literally I'm learning from my family kind of almost in the same way I would have learned it and should have learned it when I was growing up. So I'm really looking forward to that right now. I'm sitting there going um, <laughs> some things, you know, in context, I learn better in context. I don't, I'm not a big write it on the blackboard and repeat it after me kind of person. So so that's what I'm looking forward to. So that's kind of what the day kind of means to me, how it's going to push me a little bit further, what I expect of my um, peers, non-Indigenous peers to be able to step up and kind of educate themselves because there's material out there, TRCs out there, Royal Commission, like there's kind of no excuse for not educating yourself. It can't just always fall to Indigenous people and this day kind of being a big ask in terms of our energy that we want to maybe put into our own our own families and our own community. So that's just what I think about for today. And yeah, so happy to happy to engage and happy to kind of share where I'm at right now. Hi. Um, yeah. So I guess to introduce myself, my name is Angel Aluk. I'm from Big Stone Cree Nation in uh, Treaty Eight Territory in Alberta. I'm in Toronto right now. I. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies. I also did my PhD in sociology at York. And, you know, I was just thinking just now, like my academic background is in sociology and race relations and the study of race and racism in Canada. And it was during researching for my dissertation that for the first time I actually read about residential schools because part of my dissertation was a sociology of the family. I was interested in understanding young Indigenous adults' migration on and off reserve and their, their uh, post-secondary and work experiences, their transitions between school and work. But everybody I interviewed ended up telling me about family and the importance of family. And one of the, the, the things I found was you know, a lot of decisions about school and work that these young Indigenous adults made was based on caring for their children, right? I want to go back to school so I can do better for my kids. Um, some of them went to university young uh, because their parents had cared for them. And so I really got this understanding of the child being a center of community and really people basing their decisions on what was the best thing. Also, people making decisions about, you know, like there was people who moved to the city to get away from unhealthy family relations. And then there was people who stayed on reserve and kind of did like distance learning or went to the local Northern Lakes College because they they wanted a strong sense of community around themselves and their children while they were going to school. So family really was an important part of my research. 
And so I really had to study the history of colonization um, and the impact it had on families in my community. And one of the first things I found was, you know, the Indian Act and Métis script and treaty divided our community between those who were First Nations and those who were considered Métis. Um, and then the other thing was residential school, uh, which really divided families and really created this system in my community of sending your kids away to school. That's one of my central issues that I examined was, you know, why are we as a Northern community sending our kids down South to go to high school and having to make this decision? In my dissertation, I talked about this ticking time bomb that happened when a youth was around um, 13 or 14 to decide, is this person going to have an education in the future? We better send them away now. And then having spoken to my dad who attended the St. John's Anglican residential school. You know, my dad, the residential school, I think only went up to grade nine or 10. So he had to go away another 250 kilometers away to do high school. That was a big thing back then. If you chose to go to high school, you, you went away to another Northern community. Uh, But then when my brothers and I became teenagers, there was this impetus to send us away uh, to get an education. And one of the things I found in my research is that sending your kids away for school really cut connections within families and people took years to rebuild those connections, but it was just like the thing you did. And that's why I wanted to study it. And then, you know, while I was working on my dissertation research on family and how residential schools broke families apart, I read the TRC reports. I also watched that film that the TRC and I think the National Film Board the National Film Board produced um, We Were Children is that what it's called yeah and I, at the time I was working on my dissertation and I was working in the faculty of nursing and I watched it at my desk at my office and um, I remember just crying because I didn't make that connection between what I was researching and my father, and also my mother's mother, who attended the Catholic residential school. And it kind of just all hit me in that moment as I was watching this film in my office. Because another thing that happened in my research is I interviewed people who were in their late 20s and early 30s. And they talked about kind of what I just called unhealthy family relations, where there was violence, Um, addiction, a lot of involvement from, you know, child welfare, dividing families. And these young adults I interviewed didn't talk about residential school. There was kind of like this disconnect between the generations. It was kind of like, well, we're at this place now where there's violence and the colonial system is still taking our families apart. But there wasn't this connection back to residential school. And I think it's because in my community, our parents didn't always talk about it. Like my dad never told me what it was like until one day we were actually on the Calling Lake Road in the middle of winter, driving to Big Stone. And it was like this whiteout storm. And and it was one of those days where you don't know what you're driving into. Like it's just all white. And he was, my dad was driving with my husband in the front seat and he started telling my husband about what residential school was like. And I feel like, you know, when you're driving in those Northern roads in the middle of winter, you feel like I can die at any moment. (laughs) I feel like he just wanted to tell this story to somebody. And he started telling my husband, the loneliest time was in the evenings when they would be sent to bed and it would be quiet, and there would be like a ticking clock. And my dad had asthma also as a child, and he would have trouble trouble breathing when he was trying to sleep, and just the loneliness. And I think that's the first time he ever expressed to me that loneliness he felt. And he was there most of his childhood. And then he started talking about how he couldn't even talk to his siblings because his siblings that were in school with him were his sisters and they weren't allowed to talk to each other because they kept the boys and girls apart. And that added to the loneliness as well. 
but he was able to have relationships and friendships with his male cousins that were there. And then my whole family made sense to me <laughs> because I understood why my dad had such strong relations to um, some of my uncles, which were his cousins, and these loving but kind of awkward relationships with his sisters. And it, it all kind of made sense, but that was the only time he ever talked about it. And then this summer he talked about it again um, because of the unmarked graves that were found. And he started talking about how, you know, they were not made to feel like humans and they were made to feel like bad people even when they were children. Um, and so my community after the unmarked graves were found in um, Kamloops, they had a few sessions with the elders, these speaking circles, and my dad has been attending them throughout the summer, you know, as a part of his own healing. So it's really, it really just impacts all the work that I do because I'm concerned about sociology of family and work and I can't talk about these things without first confronting what happened in my family. My mom is also a social worker. Like my dad works with youth and culture. He's a director of youth and culture in our first nation. And my mom's a social worker. And my parents just pour themselves into community. They're at like at every funeral, every wedding, every crisis. And it's part of their official jobs too. So there's kind of blurred lines that happen there. But I don't know, it's, it's hard to talk about. And I feel like my parents pour themselves in the community because like there's a lot of violence and death that have happened in our family that are still happening today. There was a death from an overdose in my family this last night. One of my cousins was murdered or committed suicide last year. You know, I, I grew up with physical violence. My parents are, are very religious Christians um, because they will not, they're not as religious now that they're older, but they, they do identify as Christians. And I feel like they had to find some sort of spirituality to, to deal with their healing. So I come from an interesting family in that way. We grew up going to the Anglican church where my dad went to residential school. My brother is buried outside the Anglican church. So it's a really complicated relationship that my family has with the church. But I think for me, the, the thing about reconciliation is my, my giving back to my community through my own research, because that's what I learned from my parents. They just pour themselves into giving back and being there to care for others. So I guess that's what, you know, decolonization and reconciliation means to me is just, if you're an educated professional indigenous person, I think you kind of have a duty to give back. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to talk for so long, but that's uh, what I wanted to share today. So thank you very much for listening. Miigwech, that was, I don't wanna say that was great, but it was, cause it wasn't great for the reasons that you know that, that I mean, but you're a great storyteller. Like just, I, I feel like I was in that truck. Um, in, the, in the back seat, listening and envisioning all of that. So, to me, Gretch, for that and for and for sharing. I don't know, Brock. Did you want to? We're just kind of talking about how uh, how we think about this day, what we expect of it, with the the Orange Shirt Day or National Day of Reconciliation, and how it influences our work and families and what we might want to see. Sure, no, that sounds good. My name is Brock Sablonaquip, and uh, my family is from the Whitefish River First Nation. And uh, I currently live close to my partner's community of Wisconsin First Nation. So we live just outside of the town of Perry Sound. And we have two kids. My children have residential school history on both sides of their family. On my side, it was my, my grandmother who went to the same school that Deb mentioned earlier. Uh, a Spanish residential school. And then on uh, my partner's side, her mom actually attended the Mohawk Institute. And so I'd say it's it's quite quite close in terms of uh, 
our family history, especially on on uh, on my partner's side. And she's a high school teacher. She teaches Indigenous Studies and Nishan Bainwin. And so she's the one who's been, I'd say, more engaged in terms of the, the whole movement that's emerged around the Orange Shirt campaign. I'd say my side of it, it was more academic. I, I worked for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as a researcher for three years and then also worked uh, directly with the chair, now recently former Senator and Justice Murray Sinclair, when the commission was first getting up and running. And I, I would say that was a profoundly transformative experience. Like I never really understood the concept of intergenerational trauma or uh, just a sense the the scale of the experience. And having worked for the commission, I had the opportunity to travel like for the first time in my life to certain remote communities in the north and places that you would maybe like to imagine would be relatively untouched by colonialism. You just keep coming up with the same sort of experiences uh, that Angela was talking about too, in terms of families that were disconnected and often in, in really severe ways that people were never able to recover from. And that, I, I think that kind of uh, aspect of residential schools makes it really tough to talk about it. Like Deb, you opened uh, mentioning that one of the challenges around this this new um, national holiday will be hopefully for settler people to take it upon themselves to learn this rather than relying on their you know native friends or coworkers to spoon feed them information. And like all of you, I've, I've received a bunch of. I am doing a talk. <laughs> Uh, on September 30th about residential schools for a well-meaning but non-native organization that just kind of wants to bring themselves up to speed. And I've also just kind of politely declined other requests. So I would say in that sense, I see this as a positive that there's, there's at least, it's one of those situations that I know it's a cliche about people often don't know what they don't know. At least Canadians, I'd say, are getting to that point where they, they're there now. <laughs> They know they don't know enough about residential schools or colonialism or indigenous peoples, and they're doing what they can to try to address that. But it, it's still, uh, there's still so much work to be done. And I really like, like Deb, you sent around some suggestions on how we could have a conversation about this. And I really like that you, you made the point, the first point is to talk about residential schools or colonial history slash contemporary colonialism. And that's one of the things that I think I'm kind of stuck on in terms of having a holiday to commemorate residential schools. There's something that's kind of, it's easier for Canadians, and I'd say for Canadian governments who, who kind of were in position to create the national holiday, or at least make it official, to apologize for things that are behind us. Like historically, they can say that, yeah, we don't operate residential schools anymore, but we're not having, you know, Indigenous Child Welfare Day or Indigenous Impoverishment Day or Indigenous Land Theft Day. And yet all those things are still with us. And so that's one of the things that I do like the idea of trying to turn the conversation a little bit so it doesn't just become something about commemoration, although I feel that's important as well. But too often, it's kind of like the whole phenomenon around land acknowledgement. It almost like seems like it's an opportunity for colonizers to give themselves a pat on the back for caring about the consequences of what they did without ever actually having to do any redress. So that's something that I'm, I'm, I'm definitely interested in. In terms of family, community influences, like Angel kind of made the point earlier about hearing her dad talk about residential schools and for the first time really being able to understand the relationships her father had with men in her family versus his own siblings. And I can totally relate to that point. And when we first had a conversation about residential schools, it was actually a book by Peter Schmaltz called The Ojibwe of Southern Ontario. And my mom was flipping through the book and came across a photo of the Spanish residential school. And she just spotted my, my grandma, her mom, in the picture. And she would have been maybe eight or nine years old, maybe younger at the time the photo was taken. And that was the first time that we ever had 
that conversation. But it was kind of the missing piece in terms of figuring out, well, why is my family so scattered? Because at that point, we were living in Saskatchewan, and I had very little connection with my extended family who would, you know, rarely visit or we would rarely go back to back to the reserve to visit them. So I think I've always kind of been interested in this. And so what I, my very first paper in undergraduate Indigenous studies as a student was looking at the residential school experience. And I interviewed my grandmother about that time. Of course, sadly, long ago, lost the tapes with all the moving that I've done. And I deeply regret that because she passed away, I think, within a year or two of doing that interview. So just on a personal level, I can certainly see the importance of this type of work in terms of speaking with former students, speaking with former staff, and trying to make sure that that uh, legacy isn't lost. And so when the opportunity arose to work for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I applied and I was really eager to do that work. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done. And it was uh, the thing that I really appreciated about the commissioners and the staff is like there was no, I don't recall any point in our work where like there was a feeling that we've done enough that makes sense like there was always more more that could be done and uh, I remember uh, Justice Sinclair he would speak about like ultimately like accountability for the commission's work would always be with uh, the former students like the survivors and he I don't want to put words in his mouth because obviously he understood the importance of his role and the, and the commissioner's work but I really admired his commitment to former students and I really thought that drove the commission's work and um, it also meant that I, I probably almost anyone who worked there felt overwhelmed at times with the scale of what had happened and then trying to address it you know 130 years after that whole system had been put in place and also in the context that we were dealing with a hostile federal government, the Catholic Church that ran almost two-thirds of its schools and seemed to be doing everything it could to thwart our work. And so it's always, and one, one thing too I always emphasize whenever I'm asked to talk about residential schools is that the federal government and the churches did whatever they could to cover it up. And it was only because of the perseverance of former students to recognize that what happened to them was morally wrong, legally wrong, like it, essentially it was a crime against humanity that it even happened, that they were able to achieve the establishment of the commission and the class action lawsuit. One of the things that also that's important to remember is the commission was paid for by the students out of their settlement. So it wasn't Canada that Canada didn't put the bill. Really, the churches didn't put the bill either. It was the former students themselves who paid for the commission's work. So in terms of, I also have a, a similar feeling to what Deb mentioned earlier about the importance of language. Like I, I am the first generation in my family that just doesn't speak Anishinaabe one as a first language. And uh, that that continues to, it'll bother me for the rest of my life. I, I hope that's something that my future research can contribute to. That was what I did my PhD dissertation on with Anishinaabe one revitalization. Okay, and I, I just have, such admiration for people who do invest that time into learning our ancestral languages because it is it is incredibly grueling. Often people are are uh, dealing with sort of like personal or family trauma while they do the work of reacquiring the language as well. So it can be very emotional for for people to to undertake that for Indigenous people to undertake that. But I do see that as something that is incredibly important to to well, to the program that I work in in Indigenous Studies, and I think I, I love how Deb said that. About she she's reached the wall in terms of English. Like I, to feel like we've dedicated so much of our lives to this colonial language, it's time to actually focus on our Indigenous ways instead. So I'll, I'll I'll just stop there, but I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation too. Can I just make a quick comment? Yesterday in my class, uh, we were talking about this history of colonization and um, 
what decolonization means and things like that. And my, my students were kind of saying what you were saying, Brock, and, and, and they weren't Indigenous students. And I don't know if I can say this, but one of them identified as white and one of them identified as a racialized person. And they both acknowledged that Canada needs to do more. And even though the, the thing they were presenting was about how Indigenous people are represented in the media, they really took the time to talk about residential schools in their presentation and this upcoming holiday and how, you know, the, the, one of my students was saying, you know, as a white person, I can't pat myself on the back and say that we've done enough. She's like, we need to learn so much more. There's so much more we need to learn. And that really gave me a look hope that, that they know how important this history is and how there's so much more to learn. So that was one bright light that I had yesterday in my class. And I was just like, so proud of my students and they know more <laughs> than some of these older people in government do about the importance of this history and how it really constructs our relationships, especially Indigenous settler relations in Canada. So yeah, I just wanted to share that because it kind of connected with what Brock said. Yeah, so Ruth, um, yeah, just to just, I didn't know that Brock. So now when I write, I'm going to say like, because, you know, writing go Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that's like wrong. I feel like I got to go back and like <laughs> change a lot of my papers uh, and say it's the Survivors Truth and Reconciliation Commission and, and their calls to action. So uh, for some reason, I didn't know that. So Chmiigwech for, for that, because that really, that's really helpful, your experience there. You're able to, you know, have that experience working with the commissioners and so many survivors and so many different communities to inform that. So very helpful for, for me to, um, to hear a lot of that. I did not know that the Canadian government did not fund this. It's actually, that infuriates me. I would love, do you know if there is something written about that at all, Brock? Because if there is, I really think it's something we need to start discussing very openly. Yeah, it's, it's part of the, the commission itself kind of explains it in its mandate is that it would it came about through the class action settlement. So when they had the independent assessment process and the common experience payment, like those payouts were negotiated through the class action settlement and those went directly to survivors. But former students, the survivors also demanded that there be a commission. And, and that's where in terms of like Canada, Canada put certain limits on the commission. For instance, that was one of the reasons why the TRC did not have subpoena powers. They were reliant on people just coming forward and, and volunteering their testimony to the, to the commission. And so uh, survivors had wanted an inquiry. They didn't quite get that. Instead, they got this truth commission and Canada did end up setting other sort of limitations around it. So it, it's kind of like this frustrating thing where it, it was survivors, again, having to negotiate they weren't able to get all that they wanted in terms of a national inquiry into residential schools, but they did get a truth commission. And ultimately it was negotiated in terms of how, how it would do its work, who would lead the commission. So it's kind of like it's in between, but yes, it was ultimately the former students who paid for the commission's work out of their settlement. Don't want to start you off being infuriated, Ruth, but there we, now we've got some truth revealed here. So, <laughs> So we've done part of our job. Right. That's part of what this all is. So, Sego, Ruth Green Nonyos, Horishona Yogongwe. So, that's about all the language I get to speak, sadly. My family's story with residential schools is multi layered, but there's also the other truth that my family is more impacted by not residential schools, but Indian hospitals. So, as part of my introduction, I'm a social work professor. Uh, and that's really something I want to highlight and talk about in a minute. But I'm really struggling with the language that's being used around this day, that it becomes a statutory holiday. Because when I've gone back and I kind of was looking at what the word holiday meant, and usually it's like the concept of a holiday was organized in connection to religious observance. 
the intent of the holiday was to typically allow individuals to do religious duty. And I find it such a challenge that we don't have language that talks about the problematics of using the word ho statutory holiday to talk about the violence that's come through the religious experiencing. I'm in a very different boat than most people in this conversation today because I didn't grow up in community. I grew up urban and then slightly rural. But in the fact that I grew up urban, I grew up with some brilliant Indigenous community members that have experienced multi layers of, in, uh, of these traumas. The image behind me is actually me and my older sister. And it was painted by Gary Miller, who spent his childhood in the Mush Hole or Mohawk Institute. When this painting was painted across the studio, the, the shared studio space, this is how I used to be babysat as a kid. My parents owned an art gallery, an Indigenous art gallery. And I remember this day very clearly because it was so hot and we wanted the windows open. And when he was painting my sister, I was lying on the floor beside the other artist who shared the shared studio space. And she still teases me about the fact that I kept bugging her for purple pencil crayons. And I remember being, I was about four when this painting was painted. A few years later, I remember being a little bit of a, you know, a, a precocious child, surprise, right? Does that surprise anybody who knows me? That in my parents' gallery, I was talking about the woman whose purple pencil crayons I would borrow. And I had just heard the stories of how she got her name so many times that as a child, I was explaining it to a bunch of white people and in the gallery. And her name is, uh, she would say a Suyan name, a Dakota name that means to walk beyond. She's always been my, she's always been my max, but she signs all of her work in that, that name to mean to walk beyond, which is I only money. And so I remember as a child hearing her story of being gifted her name when she was just a little one because she was about to be sent off to residential school. I remember Gary having conversations with my dad. I remember their shared, the man that they also shared the studio with, Don McClay, talking about being in group homes, in foster homes. My job was to, when I was little, one of my jobs, jobs was a very important job, was to steady the totem pole that he was carving. And I remember steadying the totem pole in the Eaton Center, that I was sitting on the totem pole in the Eaton Center while he carved it. That totem pole now stands in front of uh, the Native Canadian Center of uh, in, in, on Spadina. Those were my childhood memories of understanding colonization, was that they were stories that your aunties and your uncles told you as they were working, as their hands were busy and they would start telling stories. Those stories sit with me when I think about the truth and reconciliation. And I am so over reconciliation. It's not my job. My job is, I've heard the truth from the people who experienced it and to share their stories as best I can in what I'm allowed to share. One of the stories that I miss hearing and holding the whole truth for that I can share is my grandmother's story. My grandmother died when I was 19 and I wish I had had the forethought like Brock to record her, but she was in an Indian hospital and my grandmother was taken when she was six to the hospital because she had severe eczema and psoriasis. And part of what she experienced was the experimentations that were done on children. And it was done in around the same time zones, around the same time periods as those residential schools but had a very different impact and an impact that we, I don't think in society talk about. You know, my grandmother was tied to a bed and had tar put on her all over her body 
my grandmother was, they found out electroshock therapy does not cure skin issues. My grandmother was, when she died, she died of sclerosis of the liver when I was 19. I never knew my grandmother as a drinker, but the alcoholism in my family was very severe. My grandmother stopped drinking the year I was born. However, the damage was done already. But when I knew my grandmother, she, she had bruise. She always had bruises everywhere. And it was because as a child who was being experimented on, she had had the thinnest skin. She cut and bruised so easily because her skin was so thin due to the amount of cortisone that they were experimenting to see how much cortisone could be put on a body before it would damage the skin. So it would heal the skin for psoriasis and eczema, but also damage the underlying tissue and her tissue never recovered. These are stories that I know don't get told. They're stories that I know are going to impact me because of the trauma my grandmother experienced and the struggle she went through. My grandfather also was in the mush hole, but we don't know any more than that. We know he's on the roll call. He never spoke of it. And my grandmother in 1952 decided it was safer to be an indigenous single mom with two kids than to live with my grandfather who was incredibly abusive due to the trauma he had experienced. And these are the family stories that are just disjointed. We don't know the whole story because of the shame and the trauma Nobody ever wanted to talk about it. So they'd drop little nuggets and tell us little bits. And those little bits are just pieced together pains. And for me, the idea of a truth and reconciliation day is not my focus. I don't wanna focus on telling these stories. I wanna focus on making sure that my beautiful, beautiful responsibilities, Elijah and Ani's hair is perfectly braided so that that sweet grass braid down their back gives them the strength they need. And so that's kind of how I'm focusing on the day. I don't, we won't be able to uncover the whole truce because the truce have sadly died with so many people and so much pain has been done. I think that it is very important that non-Indigenous people learn truths. And I'm willing to share this story, these stories, because they are the truth as what I know them. And they're broken because the truth can't be told fully because of the pain. But in that, I want my kids, I want my grandmother's grand, great-grandchildren to be able to walk proudly. I have the hugest fear. Every, like one of the day, every day I have a huge fear that I'm going to get a call that my child has been abused or harmed and I'm terrified of their braids being cut off. And I know that comes from the trauma of residential schools. I know it comes from the trauma that we're still seeing in colonial violence, that we have social media taking up spaces of boys with braids. Now I don't have a boy, I have a two-spirited person. But the fact that my child told me at four that they were two-spirit, that's the truth. That's what we need to be moving forward on, is that when they told us they were two-spirit, they told us that they'd always been two-spirit because they made that decision when they sat at the table with the four sacred beings. And they had not heard those stories before. I'm pretty sure I had, they'd never heard the stories of the, of the two sets of twins before they told me that they, they made the decision to be a two-spirit when they sat at the table, before they came to this world. That's the truth for them. And I know that the resiliency of our ancestors have come through my children. And that's what I'm focusing on. So I think that it's very important that non-Indigenous people take the time to learn I always say there were so many brave survivors that shared their stories and made them public that those stories need to be gone. I think people need to take time to go and actually listen to the stories that the survivors recorded. The survivors bravely recorded their stories so they weren't lost. 
lost like the little bits of pieces that I have of my grandmother's story, of my grandfather's story. They need to stop and listen to that so that I can focus on spending a day reminding my children of all that they are instead of spending the whole time educating non-Indigenous people. I was gonna talk about being a social work professor, but I don't know if I feel like doing that right now and how much I hate the fact that social work is continually harming our babies. I joke all the time that uh, the only reason I teach in social work is to remind everybody not to steal our children anymore and that that, that needs to be done. But that's also one of those hard spaces because as a social work professor, I go in and I teach our trauma every day instead of focusing on the fact that my kid wore their hair in a braid today again. And they will always wear their hair in a braid. And when asked if they wanna cut their hair, they say no, because that's my memory. And so I think that's where I'm gonna leave it today. You got your Ruth, and I really like the um, paintings. <laughs> I don't think I've met your sister, so I can't really tell uh, likeness or not likeness, but uh, I think I was just chatting with um, relatives who, uh, who are going to a cousin's wedding tomorrow and uh, coming from uh, Alberta. And uh, when he was negotiating, he works with the medical school there. And uh, he said the first thing he negotiated was a parking spot. I, went, I wish I did that before I went to your, because you can't give a land acknowledgement without returning something, even if it's a parking spot to Indigenous people. I went, I wish I knew that there should be an Indigenous parking lot. Anyway, I don't know, for some reason, it made me think of that, like not for, you know, just like where the words have no meaning. There's like, we, we work in a space where things are so conceptual and things are so abstract and we have to teach this and it's so deeply personal. There's some stories I can't tell because I'll have a total breakdown in, in teaching. I have to have other people tell them or, or say, go listen to this podcast or, because it takes a lot out of you, right? Like you're just exhausted at the end of the day. But I thought like there's, um for it not to be meaningless, like what are you going to do that's that's behind the words? So it's not just you know, patting yourself on the back and, and, and like, like, like what land is the university going to return to us? How about a parking spot? Not asking a lot really, but so I just thought, I've never known anyone to do that. He goes, he goes, I knew the salary was going to come, but I wanted that parking spot because as a student, they were nickel and diming to pay the parking while they were getting an education there, right? They had to like find the quarters and find the dimes and find the nickels in order to be able to attend class. So he said, I knew that, you know, if you take that land acknowledgement seriously, I need a parking spot. So there's like little, even little things like that can make people's lives so much easier. But to me, it just made me, made me think of that in terms of uh, for there to actually be concrete action. Um, and uh, I was mentioning this to, an, in another conversation that I was having about um, like, what does decolonization mean? Like, sometimes I'm uncomfortable with the word because it means whatever, right? Like, people just, it means whatever people want it to mean. And uh, and I'm on so many panels, and I'm happy to try to educate where I can because I'm an educator. Like, that's kind of what I do. And and maybe I, I, I try to pick where there might be the most impact. I prefer give priority to communities and to student groups um, <laughs> to, than to others and try to say, you really need to get diversity of voice. Like, my experience isn't, like, like even this group, like everyone has a unique sort of unique sort of perspective here, but people need to hear from different perspectives. But what I haven't seen is a panel of really privileged white people or non-Indigenous people saying what they're going to give up. It's like, what are you going to do? Like I, what sort of prestige or title or something are you going to, uh, is going to go out the door? Like what's going to de something, right? That's going to support communities. I haven't seen that yet. That's like my fantasy panel. I want to <laughs> convene a group of people who are going to say, this is actually what I'm going to do. I'm going to act on being an ally. I'm going to act on whatever. And this is what, what, what I'm going to do. Cause there's, to me, that's more reciprocity. Like where's the reciprocity? Like there's, it's not reciprocal yet in, in my view, in terms of Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I know sometimes there's critiques of reconciliation and I kind of think, well, whose version of it are you talking about? And just listening to what Brock said, I said, there's no way I'm going to diss people who came forward and told their stories. If this is what they said they wanted, then I'm gonna support that. 
And that's sort of the position that I've taken having like my mother being part of those processes and having gone and, and she being called upon a lot to, to, to talk on the 30th to the point where she was double booked and, and as a residential school survivor, because a lot of other people are not willing to talk about it, it's too painful for them. But she's able to for that day, but then, um, then we're dealing with the outfall of that later because you're reliving a lot. <laughs> like we're dealing with that later, right? Like she'll step up for that day, but then it's not a good, it's not good after. Like there's, there's an impact in, in doing that. So, so part of this conversation was to sort of take some of that burden off the survivors and have us take up some of that responsibility to kind of try to speak for, for those who can't anymore or, or won't for, for their own reasons that I completely respect. And, uh, I'm just going to stop there and, and um, Brock and, and Ruth can comment, comment if they want. But I've learned a lot from, from this conversation and, uh, and, and realize more important the, the work that we do in the communities, but also in our jobs as educators and then trying to work within colonial institutions to try to, I guess, change them. And it's so, it's so much work and energy to do that. So, so just on the lighter side, I think we should all get a parking spot. We should all... <laughs> I You're occupying our territory. I want a parking spot. I went so clever. Why didn't I think of that? But you know, I'm putting my trike right in the middle of the damn parking spot. Right? That's because I don't drive. I'm still putting the trike right in the middle of the parking spot. Thank you very much. So there's a long story, but I've designed and developed project research projects that I've never actually got to come to fruition due to some of the other commitments I've made to the university and other spaces. And one of the projects, Deb, I'm looking forward to submitting my ethics for this one. And I'm going to do it if, even if I don't have, I, I've applied for funds, but I don't know if I'll get them. And it is actually to talk to senior level administrators at the decanal level and above about what are their personal and professional responsibilities. So don't just hire an Indigenous person to do all the work. What are you doing, right? If it, you know, and I, I hold, you know, the Honorable Sinclair's words of education got us into this mess, education will get us out. Very dear, right? As somebody who my research and my understandings and my work outside, because I, you know, social work's not my my beloved, I'd rather much talk about pedagogy and education and those spaces. So I really want to know how do we, how do we educate and support people in this learning without damaging ourselves? And when, when do we, when do we hand it off and say, okay, we've done enough educating non-Indigenous people. There's enough of you we've, we've shared our stories with. Instead, it used to be Indigenous studies were always taught by non-Indigenous people. Then Indigenous people took over, which is freaking fantastic. But when do we have to not be the ones only doing the education on their responsibility? Because they used to teach about us as subjects or as objects, right? And now we get to teach about ourselves as the subject. But when do we get to move beyond into a space where non-Indigenous people take up the responsibility of talking about their role in the positioning? I don't know. Further thoughts? You'll get the funding. It's a good topic. Uh, yeah, I, I, I hope I, I've, I've applied for a few times and I, I keep not getting funding. So I don't know. Oh, maybe people don't want to go there. I think that might be <laughs> yeah. it is that it's a little bit too disruptive, disheveling of the, I think it's a dishevel of the Canadian understanding of politeness, right? To say, you have to take personal responsibility. It's kind of like, what are you willing to give up? That idea of putting prestigious white people on a panel and having them talk about what they're willing, what they're able, what they should, not willing, what they should be decentering. I don't know if you have any final reflections, Brock, or thoughts on listening. No, I'm, I'm really grateful for the invitation and that you organized it. So in English, Deb, I, I think that, I mean, one of the challenges I find is to not get caught in the sorrow or the grief or the despair in terms of studying colonialism. And that was, that was part of the reason why I felt like for my for my PhD work, 
I was still very aware of what had gone on in residential school, but the reason why I chose language revitalization is because I thought this is a specific way that Indigenous people have organized themselves and created movements to address or counter the residential school legacy or impacts. So I'm always encouraging my students to choose those type of topics. Like I'd say one of the most common ones that students approach me with is that they want to study usually uh, like the one, and maybe it's just because for me, it's, it's kind of the most, the scariest one, but like indigenous youth suicide is usually the one topic that I keep having students come and say they want to do that in first year indigenous studies. And I'm always cautious of that because I want people to understand and, and Ruth, you probably have better language than I do for this, like in, in terms of your field and your training. But like I, I do try to focus on things that are not going to draw people into and perhaps even leave them in a bad space, you know, emotionally or, or intellectually. So I think that's something that's really important for anyone who's working in this field in terms of Indigenous education is to also as educators to try to make sure that we don't leave our students in those places. Because I certainly remember uh, learning very little about Indigenous people throughout my education. It wasn't until I got to university. And then at times just being overwhelmed just with, with I guess, grief. And I remember one book in particular, David Stenard, he was a historian at the University of Hawaii. And he wrote this amazing book called American Holocaust. And it looks at just the impact of colonization on all these different parts of the Americas, including like the Pacific Islands. And it, it just in terms of when you see like the whole breadth of it, it can be really overwhelming. And so I think that's going to be part of it. And that's uh, like, even when we talk about residential schools, I, I like thinking in terms of the orange shirt movement as an example of something positive that people are doing. And that's community driven, you know, like it, it didn't emerge from, the Trudeau cabinet or, you know, like senior level bureaucracy and indigenous services. It was something that community members started and it spread. And so looking to those type of, and it could be water walkers. I know Deb, you've done a lot of research in that area as well, but where those are, in some cases, you can even trace it to an individual or a very small group of people who were willing to take that on. And for me, that's inspiring. And I, I try to as much as possible, focus my attention on that and, and, and my students as well. Yeah. But thank you again. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. I don't have anything more to say. I thought that was a great summary, a great uh, summary and closing, Brock, unless there's something else that Ruth wanted to, wanted to say. I thought that was great. And I agree. I don't like being in that dark place all the time either. So I can imagine that. <laughs> So if there's nothing else, I want to thank you for this. I know it was kind of last minute, and but I really wanted to, like Brock, it, it is important, you know, like I don't, I'm never going to, like survivors had their experience, right? And this did come from communities. I just really want to maybe shed some insight and in, in thinking about it in ways, you know, how Ruth opened that, like, like we're not all going to throw fireworks out, or maybe some people will, like, like, you know, there's a lot to learn, but there's also a lot to that, you know, there's a lot to learn from survivors. I'm always amazed at my mother. Sometimes I just, you know, I'm so overwhelmed. And I said, how did you do this? She goes, you just do it. Like, you just do it. I go, Nike stole that from you. So it's just kind of, <laughs> you know, so it's good to hear these kind of stories. I really appreciate this. I think people kind of need to hear from us kind of more on our terms rather than, you know, having to perform at a certain time when people want you to form. I mean, I've got a couple of things lined up too, but uh, I was trying not to overwhelm my day because I think I have to help my mom with her stuff, <laughs> her commitments as well. So uh, she'll be doing them through Zoom as well. Jimmy Gwetch, and hopefully my, it's looking a little brighter mm -hmm. here. So that's good news. So it's been a dreary kind of stormy hurricane like weather. So this is good. So enjoy this fall and, uh, and Jimmy Gwetch to everyone. I, I really appreciate it. We watched to all of our speakers today. If this conversation triggered anything for you, or if you feel like you need to kind of debrief with anyone, we suggest that you check out our website. We have a list of mental health resources that you can access and people you can contact. You can find that information at iejproject.info.yorku.ca.
While you're there, you can check out some of our other resources that we've developed, including podcasts, video, annotated bibliographies, student projects. All of this is available on our website. And let us know on our social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. What did you do for Orange Shirt Day? What did you do for National Day for Truth and Reconciliation? We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to know what you learned. Chibi Gwich. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.